Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, Spectral Geometry in the Clouds. Um, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Irving Calderon, who is going to tell, talk to us today about the spectral gap for random shot key surfaces. As usual, don't hesitate to ask questions, whether by talking or um, in the chat. I'll, I will relay them to the speaker. So, yeah, uh, Irving, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks a lot to the organizers for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy to, to speak here about this um, this work. I've been meaning to do it for a couple of weeks now, and this is the first time I do it, so don't be too harsh, please. <laughs> um, so uh, what I want to present you today is a joint work with Michael McGee. And so <clears throat> I'm, uh, my talk will have uh, three main parts. Uh, in the first part, so the, let me just say that in a few words, the topic is uh, st the study of uh, the spectrum of the Laplacian of hyperbolic surface. So in the first part, I will uh, give the background and motivation. Uh, so the discussion in this part will be um, around Selberg's one-quarter conjecture. Um, then in the second part, state our main theorem. But really, I will... Um, uh, here I, I will present some statements about spectral gaps for uh, random hyperbolic surfaces. So uh, ours is one of these, but I'll present other two statements as well. And in the third part, let me call it sketch of the proof. But uh, the real goal is to tell you what are the what are the tools that go into the proof and try to convince you why why these are the why, why these tools are very natural and yeah if, if I manage to do that I think I'll, I'll be very happy so let's start uh, with some uh, base definitions so I will look at hyperbolic surfaces meaning smooth Riemannian surfaces of constant curvature minus one and of course the uh, the first example is the hyperbolic plane. I will work with the upper half plane model, so complex numbers with a positive imaginary part. We have here the usual formula of the hyperbolic metric, and <clears throat> I will consider the action of two by two real matrices on on the on H by Mavis transformations, as usual. So this action identifies, well, this action is by isometries. And in fact, it identifies a group of orientation preserving isometries of hyperbolic plane with a group PSL2. Well, now throughout the talk, I will assume that all my surfaces are complete, connected and orientable. And this is to ensure that I can write them as uh, as a quotient of the hyperbolic plane modulo a discrete subgroup gamma of PSL 2 r So this is the notation I'll, I'll use throughout the talk. X is the surface and gamma is the discrete subgroup. Okay, now, <clears throat> in addition, I'll, I'll always assume that my group gamma is finitely generated, or if you prefer, the surface X is geometrically finite. So the picture that uh, you should have in mind is the following. I mean, this is the, all the surfaces we can get. We either have compact surfaces of genus at least two, like this one on the left, or we can have non-compact uh, surfaces. And in this case, there are two kinds of, of ends. So the, the non-compact parts are either funnels, which are these ones, so these are ends of infinite volume, infinite area, and the cusps are the ends of finite area. So only two kinds, and you have finitely many of these um, ends. Okay. So now, uh, 
all my like all my hyperbolic surfaces come equipped with a with a with a Laplacian, and for for H two it's this one. I wrote here the formula, and when I have my surface X presented as H two mod gamma, the Laplacian on H will descend to a Laplacian on my surface X. I denote it delta X. And I will consider it as a as an as an operator on L2 of X. So the, the, the important properties is, is that as an operator on L2 of X, this is unbounded, self-adjoint, and positive semi-definite. And usually we label the eigenvalues of the Laplacian in increasing order. So these are always uh, greater or equal than zero, and I and I label them like this in increasing order. Okay. <clears throat> so these are all the basic definitions I wanted to to recall, and now we're ready for for Selberg's uh, conjecture. So here, gamma will be the group of two by two matrices with integral coefficients and determinant one. So this is my gamma, and now. For any positive number n, I have a congruent subgroup, gamma n. So I just take uh, the elements of gamma that are congruent to the identity modulo n. And as before, x is the surface uh, associated to gamma, and xn will be the, the one associated to gamma n. Um, so Selberg's conjecture says that lambda 1 of xn is always greater or equal than one quarter. Um, so in in like I'll try to to say a bit on about the the significance of both lambda one and one quarter. But before doing that, let me just mention uh, very briefly some uh, contributions towards this conjecture. So th this conjecture was posed by Selberg in a 1965 article, and in that same uh, article, he showed that uh, lambda 1 is always greater or equal than 3 over 16. And then uh, 20 years later, Huxley proved the conjecture for n less or equal than 18. And uh, Several years later, this, uh, this is a result. I mean, this is the best we have up to date. This bound by Kim and Sarnak. They show that lambda one is always greater than 0 0.238. Well, yep. So, but let me now just stop here to, to say a, a little bit about what's going on. So we have the following situation. We have gamma n, which is a subgroup of gamma. And in fact, it is finite index. So when we go to surfaces, I have a natural projection of xn to x, and this is a finite curve. So in this in this situation of finite coverings, we have uh, the following. Um, let's see, let me change color. So say that I consider a, a finite covering y of x and some uh, function, some function phi, some complex valued function phi on x on the small surface. So uh, if this phi is a lambda eigenfunction of the Laplacian of x, then lambda will lambda when I compose lambda this phi sorry with with the the covering map that I denote p, I get a lambda eigenfunction of the Laplacian of the big surface. So. <clears throat> This means that all the eigenvalues of the small surface are also eigenvalues of, of the big surface. And 
a way to write that is um, saying that the multiplicity of lambda as eigenvalue of y, that's the meaning of this notation, is always greater or equal than the multiplicity of lambda as eigenvalue of the Laplacian of, of the small sort. And in particular, lambda 1 of the covering is always less or equal than lambda 1 of the small surface. So in, in this setting, for this very special family of, of coverings, Selberg tells us that this uh, lambda 1 cannot get arbitrarily close to 0. Okay? Uh, so, so in light of this, well, let me just uh, write here a definition that I'll need later. I will say that uh, lambda is a new eigenvalue of the Laplacian of y if I have the strict inequality. So since we already know that the, the conjecture holds by Huxley result for, for small values of n, then in reality, if we wanted to show the conjecture, we only need to look at uh, the new eigenvalues at each level. That's that's like the the, the key thing. So to prove the wall for the conjecture. To finish it, to look at new eigenvalues. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, yeah, let me say something about uh, the role that, I mean, why, why this, uh, this kind of statements is interesting. And so I'll tell you a bit about lambda one and, and one quarter very, very briefly. So here, uh, when you have, so suppose X um, has finite area, then, this lambda one uh, controls, uh, first of all, the, the mixing speed of the geodesic flow of my surface. And also it tells us about the, it, it measures in some sense the connectivity of my surface. So, so these are a dynamical and a, and a geometric uh, reason to care about this, this lambda one. And regarding the one quarter, uh, why one quarter? Well, I guess it depends uh, who you ask to. Um, if you ask uh, a spectral geometer, probably he or she will tell you that one quarter is the bottom of the spectrum of the Laplacian of H2. But if you ask the same question to someone with a background more on the representation theory, uh, he or she will tell you that the eigenvalues below one quarter um, come from unitary representations of PSL2R with uh, whose matrix coefficients decay slowly. So this is the complementary series. And if you ask me, I would tell you that there, my, my, my reason is this, this identity, uh, which looks rather silly, but hopefully if you don't already know why, why this identity is, is, uh, is not silly, uh, hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll believe that it, it has some meaning to it. And yeah, I think this is it for, for the motivation. Now, let me go to, to, the, to the results. So in this topic of, of studying the, the spectrum of the Laplacian, there, there are some statements like, like Selberg's conjecture where 
where you care about a very special surface or family of surfaces and the other um, let's say a popular approach is well maybe you are not able to to show what you wanted for this very special kind of surfaces oh let me get the light on again um, but rather you you want to say well, you want to describe the, the, the typical properties of the spectrum of the Laplacian, say of a, of a generic surface, and a way to make sense of what's a generic surface is by working with, with, a, with a model of, uh, of a random uh, surface. Uh, and the one I want to consider today is a very simple one called the, the random cover model. So, This goes as follows. I will fix an initial surface X. And if you take any uh, positive integer N, then there are only finitely many uh, coverings of, of X of degree exactly N. So I, I will pick at random one with uniform distribution. And this is the uh, this calligraphic XN. So this XN now is it's a random surface. And well, since, since I, I motivated um, the first part of the talk with Selberg's uh, conjecture, then let me show you a, a probabilistic analog of the conjecture. And this is a result by, by Hyde and McGee of 2021. So here X is a non-compact and finite area hyperbolic surface. So they show that in any interval of this form, zero, one quarter minus epsilon, the probability that Xn has new eigenvalues here uh, tends to zero as the degree of the covering tends to infinity. So, so yes, I told you, if you take the, the probability out, this is like what the precise thing you need um, to prove Selberg's conjecture, discard new eigenvalues in the in the interval zero one quarter. So in that sense, I, I call this like a, a probabilistic uh, analog of, of of that conjecture. And I will I would also like to mention here a result uh, for a different model. Uh, this is the other. Uh, th this is another uh, very important. Uh, model for random surfaces. And well, there are very various statements, but I wanted just to present one. Um, so here, uh, XG is a random, uh, a by Peterson random compact hyperbolic surface of genus G. Well, this is, sorry, I forgot to say, uh, resolved by Anna Thamaran and Monk. And they show that the probability that lambda one of XG is uh, greater or equal than 2 over 9 minus epsilon goes to 1 when g goes to infinity. Okay. Um, well, now uh, let me let me finally uh, state uh, the result about in, in this joint work with 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 Michael and Frederic. So here we will focus in the case of Schottky surfaces. So by Schottky, I mean a hyperbolic surface that has infinite area and has no cusps. Or in other, in other words, it, I have, my surface has funnels, but has no cusps. So this is the, like the, the simplest such surface. And in the rest of the talk, I, I will use this fo the following notation. This half plane of complex numbers of real part um, greater than some parameter t, I will denote it by h of t. So what we show is that if x is a Schottky surface, then if you take any compact uh, subset of h of delta over 2, then the probability that this random covering xn has new resonances in this compact window 
goes to zero as the degree of the coupling goes to infinity. Um, so in this, I mean, the, the, the most important change, I guess, is this word, resonances. Since we're dealing with, with infinite area surfaces, the, it's more natural to, to consider this, um, these resonances of the Laplacian instead of, of the eigenvalues. I will recall um, the definition in the next slide. And this delta is uh, just uh, the, the Hausdorff uh, dimension of the limit set of my group gamma. Um, yeah, um, is the statement clear? Yeah. Okay. Well, so let me now. What, sorry, yeah. what kind of value do you expect for the host of I mentioned? We know that it's between something and something. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so this, uh, that's a good question. This, this delta gamma is always between zero and one. And it can attain any value between zero and one. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Thanks. Um, okay, so let me. Uh, give the definition of resonances. Um, so let me first start with the, the resolvent of the Laplacian. Uh, so I will uh, denote, uh, parameterize in the following way. Rx of S will be the inverse of Laplacian minus S times one minus S identity. And I will we define it in this way initially for, for parameters S with real part greater than one half. So at this point, we have this uh, family of bounded operators on, on L2 of X. And in fact, this is a, this is a, a meromorphic family. And the poles at this point really correspond just to the, to the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Uh, through this map mapping, s goes to s times one minus s. So, so, so here is where we start to see this um, this 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 formula that I that I said before. One quarter is equal to one half times one minus one half. Uh, this is where it's coming from. But now <clears throat> we can we can extend this. Uh, family of operators meromorphically to the whole complex plane. But this time, this, the extension will be as a family of operators from smooth compactly supported functions on, on the surface to smooth functions. And, and uh, the poles of this, this uh, meromorphic extension is what we call the resonances of X. Um, so notice that I, I still use the same. From now on, Rx is this meromorphic continuation. So now I have a meromorphic family of operators defined on the whole complex plane. And the resonances are the poles of this family. OK, now, <clears throat> well, this is, this is the statement. And now I want to say, what are, what are the, the the key steps of the proof? But before before giving the statements, I, I need to introduce two definitions. Uh, I need to introduce uh, transfer operators and the notion of of strong convergence. These are the, the the key the key definitions that we need for the proof. Um, so let me start with transfer operators, and I will I will explain it. In, to be concrete, uh, I will explain it for, for, for a Schottky surface for which gamma is generated by, by just two elements. So for such a gamma, such a gamma always admits can, a... Can you first say something about uh, this resolvent set? How much of it is eigenvalues? Are there any eigenvalues? Yes, yeah, so the, the eigenvalues only only lie in this half plane, real part greater than one half. 
when you but take real part less than one half? Shopke groups, do you know that there are any eigenvalues? Uh, no, generic, generically, there are no eigenvalues. So, that, but there are always resonances. That's why resonances is is a natural object to look at. Yeah, having eigenvalues is quite is quite rare. In what sense is this rare? What what's known about this? Yeah, I mean, well, we we know when when there are. I mean, we know that. In order to have eigenvalues, um, we need delta gamma greater than one half. This is just because uh, this is a result of, of Sullivan. But what I mean is that I mean this is this is not a theorem or anything. But my intuition is is that this um, Philip Sarnak conjecture that. Typically, there are not mass forms uh, in, in a generic finite volume thing. I think this goes on to, to Schottky if you restrict just to eigenvalues. Um, but this is not this is not a rigorous thing. So this is not known. That's that's what I was trying to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it's not known. It's not known. But okay, okay. Thanks. We also believe that it's very rare that there are actually eigenvalues. I mean, there is a quantum eigenvalue, right? Uh, like Patterson Sullivan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the the condition that I wrote. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Uh, when when so you have this like, condition, then the first eigenvalue is is delta gamma times one minus delta gamma. Right. Yeah. Then that's one third dimension. Mm. Okay. So let me move on to the. Yeah, transfer operators. Okay, so like I said before, I'll I'll focus in in the case of a of a Schottky group with only two generators, and I can only I always describe them as follows. Uh, I'll consider this uh, yellow line is the real axis, and I'll consider two half disks centered in the real axis. Oop. three and the four and now i will pick an element of psl2r let's say gamma one that sends the geodesic to this one and similarly a gamma two doing this and now, so gamma one, gamma two in PSL two R, gamma will be generated by gamma one and gamma two. Uh, and the important thing is that I'm assuming that the that the disks, I mean the, the closed half disks are are pair, pairwise disjoint, like in the picture. Um, and let me call V the union of, of my four half disks. Yep. So now, uh, so consider a complex parameter S and mm, a complex valued function. And I define the operator as as this formula, but don't look at the formula. Let me explain you to you what what this is saying. So, for example, imagine that um, I have this picture, and I apply first my element uh, gamma one. Then I, I will look at the images of the of the initial disks. So I get something like this. I I get three smaller disks inside here. And let me say that uh, this is my initial point, ZA, somewhere here. And then I will apply the generators and the inverses to each point in a way that approaches me to the boundary. 
So if I start with this point ZA, then there are three possibilities. These are the, the these red um, dots. So these are the points here. So what what my operator is doing is just summing the the values of the function at the neighbors um, of my point in this sense that I just told you about. And then you have this um, weight that depends on, on my complex parameter. So, so it's, a, it's a very simple thing. And the, the key things that there are two key facts, well, in reality, just one, but uh, that we need to know about transfer operators for the talk. The first one is that uh, restricted to a good functional space, let's say the space of holomorphic L2 functions on, on, the, on the union of the disks, all my operators LS are compact. I mean, even more, uh, they are trace class, but let's let's stay with compact. Uh, so now I have this, these are not uh, self-adjoint operators, but at least they are compact. And so I can, I can just uh, think about the eigenvalues. And the, the second thing, let me maybe use different color, because it's the really important thing, is the connection between these operators and, and resonances. So if you take a complex number, say with positive in imaginary part, uh, then, so for S, um, S is resonance, of my Schottky surface, if and only if, one is eigenvalue of the corresponding operator ls. So that, that that's the key. That that's how we use transfer operators to to detect resonances. Um, is this setting for a single surface clear, or are there any questions? I think it's fine. Now, uh, but we're interested in, in, in this situation where, where I have a surface and a finite covering. Um, and in this case, I have um, a specially, uh, specially tailored operator that will allow me to detect new resonances. Uh, so let me, let me just uh, say how things go. So I, I will, I will consider a homomorphism from gamma to the symmetric group uh, Sn. So in fact, this is this is the way we we parameterize finite coverings. If you if you consider any such homomorphism, then you have uh, a corresponding finite covering that I will call X phi, and also we have a, a n minus one dimensional unitary representation. Uh, I wrote it here. So you have your homomorphism phi, and then you, you just compose with the standard n minus one dimensional representation of, of Sn. So this is acting, you act on c to the n just by permuting the coordinates, and, and you just look at the, at the hyperplane uh, sum of coordinates equals zero, and this is this is the this is the representation. So the, the composition it's what, what I will call a row. And now I have my operator that detects new resonances, and everything looks very similar. You see, I have. Uh, I mean, the key difference is that now I have to consider vector valued functions, but other than that, the, the basic idea is the same. I'm summing the values of the function on, on neighbors of, of my initial point. I have the same weights as before, 
and I have this this action by by the by the representation row that I just wrote here. Um, so, so here the images are the ones for your surface you're taking a covering off. And the covering is encoded in the row. The, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the covering is encoded in, in this phi and in the row. Yeah. And uh, the gamma j's are the ones for the fixed surface. The, yeah, the gamma j's are the generators of my initial uh sort of Schottky surface. Yeah. So so well the, the, the link between resonances and, and new resonances and 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 these operators is is like the, the the one you would expect. Again, for complex numbers with um, positive real part, S is a new resonance of my of my covering x phi. If and only if one is an eigenvalue of the corresponding uh, transfer operator for the same parameter S. So th this is a, the way we detect. Uh, new resonances, and this is just for in a deterministic setting of of a, of a fixed covering. Um, now, the second definition I need is the notion of uh, strong convergence, and this is a notion that comes from um, com comes from free probability and operator algebras. So here, what we need is the following: I will consider now a sequence of unitary representations. These are the row n's of the same group gamma as before. So it's a free group into generators. And I will say that my sequence strongly converges to some uh, representation row infinity if for any element in the group algebra of gamma, um, the operator norm of row n of alpha converges to the operator norm of row infinity of alpha. And maybe I'll just recall here that this, the elements of the group algebra are just finite sums. Um, a gamma, gamma, uh, so finite, with complex coefficients. Okay, but uh, for my for for this setting of of, of my my random covers, I will need a, I will need to somehow add the the, the randomness somewhere. So this is just a, a very mild variation of this definition. Yeah. Uh, how this norm is defined? This is the operator norm. Uh, operator norm. With respect to the to the to the norm coming from the inner product of the Hilbert spaces. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, so so now for for my random um, coverings, uh, I'll 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 use this this uh, variation of the definition. This time, this uh, the the row ends will be random unitary representations of my group gamma. And I will sell, say that my sequence of random representation representations strongly converges in probability if this, um, this convergence here holds in probability for any, for any alpha in, in the group algebra. So it's the same definition, but we change this convergence by convergence in probability. Okay. Okay. Now, now I have all the definitions that I need to state the 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 two key results uh, for the proof. Uh, let me just look at the time. Yeah. Right. Mm. So the first one is is the following. <clears throat> Um, so again, I consider my sequence row n of random unitary representations of, of my of my free group gamma, and I will assume that they converge to to the left regular representation of my group gamma. 
then what we show is that for any compact K, as in our main statement, there exists a positive integer L that depends only on, on my group gamma and on, on the compact window that I'm looking at, such that uh, the probability that the, the L power of the transfer operator has norm strictly less than one for all the parameters in my compact window, this probability will tend to one as the degree of the covering tends to infinity. Now, <clears throat> in the setting of our main result, where we consider this uh, random coverings Xn, the, the representations rho n uh, that appear come from, from, a, from, from the following. I will consider, we consider uh, a random homomorphism from gamma to Sn. Again, I have only two generators, so I only need to specify the image of these two generators. Hence, I have finitely many such homomorphisms, and I can pick one at random with uniform distribution. So this is the, the phi n that I write here, and the row n's are the corresponding unitary representations. As I said before, we just compose it with the standard n minus one dimensional representation of Sn. So these are the, the row n's that are relevant to my to my model of random surfaces. And the, the thing that we need is this uh, result of uh, Bordenave and Collin uh, from 2018. They show that this precise uh, sequence of random unitary representations, they do converge to, to, the, to the left regular representation of gamma. So this allows us to, to apply our proposition for. Um, so let me just tell you how, how, how we combine these two things to, to get our spectral gap result. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So, um, so let, let me consider first um, again, a, a deterministic setting. So I, I have my phi, some fixed homomorphism from gamma of Sn and uh, associated covering X phi and my, my representation row. So um, if I have that this LS row to the L, this norm is less than one, then, oops, so this tells me that uh, in particular one isn't eigenvalue of LS row to the L. So this means that one is in the eigenvalue of just the operator ls row. And by the connection between um, transfer operator and, and new resonances, this means that s, I mean, if, if the real part is greater than zero, then s isn't a new resonance of x5. So what this tells me is that the probability that uh, Xn has no new resonances in K is less, is greater or equal than the probability that I have this inequality or less in K, and uh, by the by the two statements I, I presented in the previous slides, this probability goes to one, ascend tends to infinity, 
So this one, this one also goes to this one also goes to one, and we're done. Okay. Um, well, now um, let me just say uh, something about the um, the proof of uh, of this uh, proposition four. Uh, the only thing I want to say is, again, the main ingredient that goes into the proof of this proposition for. So, uh, let's see. So we have, we have the following. So, so the assumption is that uh, we assume that uh, for any uh, alpha in C of gamma, again, I take my finite sum, a gamma um, rho n of gamma. So I have that this norm Converges in probability to the same thing that I replace my gamma n by, by this deterministic representation rho gamma. Okay. So <clears throat> But now, um, the thing is that if, 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 if we write down in, 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 the, in a good way the, the transfer operators, you will see that this ls rho n will, will look something like this. So the only thing that changes, let's say to the power L, will be a sum over the, say, the elements of word linked L of, I will see again, the representation rho n gamma. And then I have some coefficient, but this time the coefficients will be uh, compact operators. So instead of complex numbers, I have a very similarly looking uh, expression, uh, but now with compact uh, operators. So here we use the so-called uh, matrix amplification trick. And what this tells us is that the this convergence above will also hold in this more general setting. So by, by, by matrix um, amplification, uh, this norm of Ls rho n to the L will converge in probability to the same thing, but replacing by the regular representation. So the, the, the takeaway is that this allows, I mean, with high probability, we, ex we expect that the norms of these operators are very close to the norm of this. Now, this is a deterministic operator. So all we have to do is uh, bound the norm of, of this operator. And this is something that people in free probability know very well how to do. Um, and we use the so-called, so to bound this norm, so bound this norm, using the Hagerup book holds inequalities. So the, in a 
in a very simple way, what, what these inequalities uh, say is that if I have uh, my operator like here, say, um, so the same thing, some operator coefficients and but here I'll have my regular representation. Um, then I can, using these coefficients, I can construct certain um, matrices whose entries are, are operators. Uh, but the, the thing is that these are finite matrices and the inequalities tell me that, that uh, I can bound the norm of this operator by the by the norm of the operators or, or by the norm of these finite matrices. Um, I don't want to bore you with the details. So I will just write the, the, the simplest case, which is the original Hagerup inequality. Um, this is the, the next one. So this is again for uh, here. These ones are uh, just uh, generators. And inverses. Generators and their inverses uh, of, of my group gamma. So if I take this uh, linear combination of rho gamma of the of the generators and their inverses, the the operator norm again. This is an operator norm. This is just bounded by the by the usual uh, Euclidean norm of the of the corresponding this a here. It's just my a one. A2, A3, A4. So you see, I, I can just get a bound on this operator by just computing the Euclidean norm of a vector. And, and this is this is the, the same kind of simplification that we get when we go to, to operator coefficients. It's the formulas are a bit more involved, but but in reality, the, the, all the ideas behind are, are already present in this in this very simple case. Uh, and yeah, I think I, I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for the lovely talk. Thank you. Um, so we have time for some questions. So everyone is welcome to ask them. Uh, we did have a few already during the talk. Oh, sorry? We did have a few already during the talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As, uh, yeah. As a question. Mm. Don't hesitate. I was um, actually wondering, so the power L that you have in your proof, uh, do you have any intuition or explanation as to what purpose it serves and why it's necessary to take such power? power? And um, how big it would be also? Yeah, I don't know if I can I can explain it in simple terms, but it seems that when when you use these kind of tools, if if you just try to if you just try to work with the original operator, the thing is that in the original operator, um you are just seeing like in this picture that I that I draw. So you start with your four disks. So let's say that the operator, the original operator only sees like these four disks. If you take the square of the operator, you, you see the next step in the dynamics. So you see the next step, you have three small disks inside. The third power, you see the next step. So I would say that when you take powers, this power, what, what it tells you is that you're looking at, at the dynamics of the of the Schottky group, up to up to the point where you care. If you just work with the with the initial operator, you're just seeing the the start. So on the dynamical side, you're losing everything. So so the intuition is that that that's the intuition. You need a power because you need to see you need to run the dynamics for a long enough time in order to to get the information that you care about. Mm -hmm. And it, and here the power is constant on your on your once you fix your compact set and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, it only depends on the compact set and the and the group. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, how is it built in, in the transfer operator that you only have the new resonances coming and not the? Uh, is it's it visible in, this, in the formula? Or? It's in this part where you take the 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 n minus one dimensional representation. So the the usual okay. I mean, the usual thing is that you look at just uh, the permutation representation well in i want to say cn um by permutation I'm permitting the coordinates and when you when you restrict to this uh, to this subspace of just taking sum equals zero of the coordinates then then that that's where you get rid of the old things the the old things will live in this line where all the coordinates are the same that's that's okay. like when you lift an eigenfunction to to the covering just by declaring that it's constant on, on the fibers, so that that's where you get rid of the of the old things by looking at this n minus one dimensional representation. Okay. And is there any kind of generalization or other settings that you could naturally try to address next? Or mm, well, this. In general, this strategy of transfer operators works in theory. Uh, in theory, it works for any, say, hyperbolic manifolds of any dimension, as long as they are complex, um, convex or compact. The thing is that if you go even just one dimension up and you want to treat the general convex or compact case, Things are not as explicit as in the Schottky case, where you have this just, I mean, on the algebraic side, it's very simple. You just have your free group. You can describe it fairly easily. Um, so you can do the same the same game of just considering classical Schottky in any dimension, and it would work yeah. equally well. But I think it, if we want to go, say, to dimension three, it would be more interesting to try to figure out how to cover a bigger family. Mm. Okay. Mm. I, it never occurred to me that these covering models uh, actually might be, uh, um, have less of a problem perhaps for higher dimensions than because it's a bit more algebraic, I guess. Because the yeah. other, oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> okay. I mean, Sorry, I'm I'm blabbing too much, so don't hesitate to interrupt me. If no, 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 and and also in this uh, this uh, result of uh, Bordenab and Collin, you you need to be dealing with a with a with a free group, so so otherwise it doesn't work. Um, so okay, uh, that that's also an important thing. Hopefully, the technology will 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 cover. Uh, surface groups uh, soon, and then we'll be able to do more. Mm. That would be nice. Is there anything anticipate expected for this? So, uh, I don't really know. I, I mean, I know people have thought about this, but but yeah, I think I, I can. I don't, I don't know what 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 are the key difficulties. Well, well, the key difficulty is that. There are relations, and then, yeah, yeah this this causes trouble. Yeah. So I guess it's uh, it's the hour, and we are starting to leave. So maybe we can um, thank you again for the great talk. Uh, thank you for the invitation. We meet, we meet again uh, next week, uh, where we will um, um, have the pleasure to listen to Matthias. Hoffman, who will tell us about the graph structure of the nodal set on Riemann manifolds. Uh, and yeah, thank you again and have a beautiful week. Thank you. Bye.